The Stumpville Affair, by James Goodridge. The news cycle of a full autumn moon cast a cold, icy glow over August Mason's farm. Mason woke at 3 a.m. to the sound of his livestock which the old farmer hated to venture out at this hour. He needed to find out why the hens riled. Stepping out into the darkness, thoughts of Deacon Calvert, the local priest who had been recently murdered in the early morning hours sent to chill through Mason's body, as well as in boots crunched at the top, as well as in boots crunched the top of short the grass as he walked to the barn. Something's got these hands worked up, said Mason, buttoning in a denim peak coat. Brown earth mixed with manure and cake to his work boots as he rushed to the hen house. Hatless Mason covered his eyes, avoiding the moonlight's glare as its brightness made him nauseous. Stumbling up to this hen house, Mason blindly felt around the inside wall, eventually locating a pair of dark tinted logos goggles, a memento from his days in the Navy during the Great War. He slipped them over his cow lips off and hair. Now, what are you ladies cackling about? Where's Muggsy? Mason wondered out loud, inquiring about his king rooster. He suddenly felt the presence behind him. The hens felt silent in almost human-like terror. Stepping out of the hen house, Mason, a loner with no wife or children, turned around to face what was going to be his, turned around to face what was going to end his life. The creature snatched at him as razor sharp fangs bit into Mason's right arm snapping it off at the elbow. Blood, bone, and muscle mass splattered all in the moonlight. Mason's lower arm sailed end over end into the air, finally landing on top of the weather house roof. As shock set in, August Mason howled in pain, body quivering. His cries reverberated into the village of Stumpville before trauma took him into eternal darkness. Just before dawn, the day laborers Mason had hired approached in a dirty pickup truck. As the headlights grew nearer, the creature which had been feasting upon Mason's prim, crimson and pink flesh vanished into a nearby tree line. The hens, which had remained silent, resumed their frenzied cackling as Muggsy the rooster emerged from the crawl space beneath the hen. Times were tough, even for folk detectives. Our clientele, those highly, those high society money bags who hired Sue and I to chase those who perform charity readings had dried up as a viable source of income. Contract work for the city's paranormal office of special concerns had slowed because of weather trouble. It was Tuesday, 12.35 a.m. Dressed in striped as your PJs and my red smoking jacket, I was in for the night. I sat behind my desk rolling, out, rolling around a nice-sized emerald from my stash on a desk blotter, wondering how much it might fetch. Off in the distance, a tugboat mule deep on the Hudson River. At least the tug captain had it work, unlike the occupants of Riverside Drive and Southern Street. A mug of heights of tea on my desk curtailed my bravest as the silence of the room was suddenly interrupted. I answered the phone on the first ring. Hello, Kirkland, I said, aware that only Stuart Kirkland, the young boy wonder and head of the OCS, was the only person who would call me at the time. How goes it with you? Hey, Madison, old pal, I ain't speechy. Listen. I know times are rough all over with this depression quite going on. So I figured you and Sue might be available for a job. Much appreciated, I said. Besides, this one's out of our jurisdiction. 
What's the affair? I asked the tree. Upstate New York, Sullivan County, that is a stump there. The local sheriff, Kilroy Bertrand, had two unsolved murders which he believes were committed by a well, a werewolf. The sheriff's a real forward thinking fellow, I chuckled. How did he decide to reach out to you? Do you remember the life of a lichen? That monograph you co opted with Sue? That's right. Sue used the noun the plume anonymous. Bertrand re read it. Bertrand read it. He thinks anonymous can solve our problem up there because anonymous must be aware of the most so much, said the old man. To me, that monograph was nothing but trouble. So what's Bob looking for? A liking to catch a liking? I guess so, Madison. He sounds desperate. Yeah, but I'm also desperate for people not to know Sue's propensities. I warned. Okay, Kirkland. I'll ask Sue. She was under the weather last night and retired to bed a few hours ago. It's her call. Fair enough, Kirkland. One question, the village of Stumpville, this is some downtown? Persons of mixed heritage, like Sue, half Native American and half Negro, and I, half Negro, half white, knew better than to work where we weren't wanted. Money tight or no money tight. I'm ahead of you, Madison. Bertrand says it's an all-American progressive town, even, even Bertrand says it's an all-American progressive town. They even have a few farms in the surrounding areas run by people of color, being Kirkland. With that, I pulled out a yellow legal pad and pencil out of my desk drawer and took down the sheriff's information. I'll phone you later in the morning after I speak with Sue. Good morning, Kirkland. Good morning, Madison. I pulled the old gold from my cigarette case, lit it with a magenta glow from my left hand palm, and took a few quick puffs before snuffing it out with my tea mug. I left the smoking room and headed upstairs to Sue's apartment on the second floor, unlocking the door with a spare key. Seek, Miss Sweetie, what you doing, gal? Hanging upside down from the ceiling, Sue pet cat secret, meow. Jet black fur taped up to five silky black tentacles, which held in place while her fork paws played with the pink ball of yarn that trailed down to the floor among Sue's kaleidoscopic colored harem doors. Three innocent copper tinted feline eyes blinked at me. Come on, gal, I ordered to which she plopped down on my shoulder, paws and tentacles secure in a piggyback ride to Sue's bedroom with me. Sue lay sprawled out, face down in a black nightgown, throat rasping and sniffed, a sign of the cold emotion. Sue, Sue, wake up, love. I think I've got a pain to fair for us if you're interested. I knelt down by my bed and tapped her arm in secret, hopped on my gloves back, doing her best cat shimmy to break Sue's slumber. Madison Prescott Cavendish, do we have to talk now? Sue asked, voice surfy, thanks to her cold. On more than one occasion, my Sue had been mistaken for Harlem Starlet's Betty Washington even being the standing for the actress for a point suit. But at this hour, rolling over to see me, kneeling beside her, feeling secret, resting atop her stomach, glamour was not on my beloved's mind. Job, what? What is it? Where? Oh, it feels so good. How much does it pay? It's upstate Stumpville. I have to phone the local sheriff in the morning if you take it, I said. What's he want, a seance? 
she said. He um, wants us to catch a werewolf. Sue sat both upright. Come again? A werewolf, I repeated. Sue's pupils turned from black to hazel. Even her happy freckles, as I like to call them, on her beautiful face were becoming inflammatory with anger. Seriously? She asked. I kid you not. According to the law, man, this werewolf has already months two people to death during a full moon. As I'm sure you know, the full moon is in sight for this week. I figure we go up there, catch the creature, detain it until morning. They give you one way ticket out of town, no sore feelings. I know you were looking to celebrate Halloween, but we need to go. Sue frowned. What if this werewolf is like me? My mind flashed back to 1914 and the nameless cosmic horror whose encounter in a lower Manhattan basement had changed our lives in ways we couldn't have imagined it possible. I guess we'll see what happens when we cross that bridge in my life. So how about it? Let me sleep on it, Maddie. Looking around, but finding nothing upon which to write a runny nose, my suit playfully ran it across my pajama sleeve. As sequence, tentacle tapped and tapped pleasure. As sequence, tentacle tapped his pleasure on Sue's arm. Good night or good morning, dear, said Sue. Rolling over, returned to dreamland with sequence snuggled in her arm. I quietly retreated back downstairs to avoid my hands. At eight o'clock sharp, Sue stepped into my apartment while I rested in peace, brought me away. She looked fabulous in a Halloween colored attire. An orange by coat with a black quill pointing out the top adorned her head while her body was clothed in a black velvet orange sweater dress, black stockings and semi heels, all cloaked beneath a black trench coat. The overnight bag in her left hand meant like a phone with a sheriff. I dressed quickly a gray tweed suit and white shirt matched by a gray fedora with black bow tie wingtips. Our first stop was across town to meet Sigmund in the care of our friend, Dotar the Magician and Elsa Cranberry, a cult detective, both of whom were on idle time. Next, we were off to Stumpville. The concrete and asphalt of New York City in the midst of a depression created into rural upstate New York, also in economic groups, as we cruised up the Hudson Valley in the dark, cherry red 1929 packet 640 roadster. After a few hours, I swung the packet on Dumpville's Lincoln Avenue, the town's, the town's main thoroughfare where Halloween jack-o'-lanterns sat as festive sentinels at the base of lampposts. Along the avenue, villagers went about their business as if they recently stepped out of a normal Rockwell campus. A few individuals in color confirmed what Kirk had told them. While Sue's nose continued its defiance, I parked the packet in front of Sheriff Bertrand's office the building was sandwiched between the Stumpville Post Office and an American Legion post that doubled as the mayor's office. I made an educated guess that Stumpville's population hovers around 400. Hey there, you must be Madison Cavendish and Santa Cruz. If, I, if not, I have to write you a ticket for parking in front of the sheriff's office in the spot with the 
the official business, Chuck the sheriff of Silver Lake and Trent, up to on the bike. Hand outstretched to greet us as we stepped out of our automobile. He was a hearty soul, the kind you expect with going to work in law enforcement. Average height, West colored wing hair, the dark colored hat, rosy cheeks, the fine light brown eyes that would rather squint than wear glasses. Bertrand wore a black suit covering a tireless plaid shirt. A badge on his lapel and a Smith and Wesson 38, hoisted in a gun belt, hanging at an angle below his pants belt, were the only indication of Bertrand's occupation. Please come inside. Glad you came, he said, as we entered into a drab pastel green, the top color green office with wooden corridor like barriers. Benches on one side, front desk on the other. Bertrand ushered us into his office, past two de deputies in khaki uniforms, each wearing surplus New York City police caps, and engrossed in a game of chess. Then we let home ourselves moved to the back of the room. A few, a few introductions in that order, Bertrand said, pointed to the to three individuals seated at a table before us. This is Mayor Douglas, this is Miss Catherine Levati, and Dr. Nielsen Zellner. They sort of make up the village council. He had a fourth council member, August Mason, but he was killed during the last cycle of the moon. Sue Bertrand and I found empty seats. Mayor Douglas, a tongue man in an expensive Navy pinstripe suit, had that old Roman Warren G. Harden look about. Miss Levati, a lanky woman with midnight dark hair, saturated with pomade, looked tired in her royal dress. My impression was that she just wanted this problem to be over with. From the dagger coat stair, he issued, I suspected that the soft and tough bearded Dr. Zelda, decked out in a bluish gray of the rest of the suit, didn't want to see it. He wasted no time confirming my suspicion. I just wanted to sell them again. For the record, voice my objection to this whole affair. It's a waste of village time and fun. Meaning no disrespect. What precisely do we know about these two open waters anyway? Calm down, Neil, said Mayor Douglas. It was becoming obvious that this council wasn't exactly pleased. We've already voted in favor of hiring Mr. Cavendish and his associate to help our boys. And by Saxon, that's what it's going to be done. The mayor's voice, though I continue to receive icy looks. After giving them a redacted oral resume, she asked, How about letting us and the sheriff work out details on the plan in private? The council nodded in agreement. Filing out of the sheriff's office, the good doctor seemed to be preoccupied with thought. Thank you, whispered Miss Levati, finally perking up. Retrat retrieved a desk, a map of the village and surrounding area, two red pencil mark X's, the note of the recent killings at the time the bodies were found. Lincoln Talbot died here, said Bertrand, pointing to a church in the south end of the village. August Mason died here, an X marks, an X marks his farm just outside the east end of the village. I feel the next attack will come in the north end, surmised Bertrand. I made a mental note that the sheriff's prediction seemed odd. Okay, Sheriff, I said. We'll need a pair of handcuffs, your map, and some type of anesthesia like 
five, four, eight, four. <laughs> That's no problem, Capitals. I have one of my men catch up to Dr. Gelman on fourth and eight. We'll set the work around 11 tonight. <laughs> I've set you up with accommodations. Drive further down Lincoln Avenue and you'll see the Doyle Hotel. Old Patty Mullins will be behind the front desk, most likely now. He'll have two rooms ready for you. I didn't know if you two were married or not, and we don't do hot sheets up here. <laughs> Chuckle Bertrand. Across the street is Camellia's Chop House. Put anything you order on Mayor Douglas's tab. Again, Bertrand Chuckle. We'll be sure to do that, Sue Smith. Soon we headed down Lincoln Avenue. While stopping at a red light, I watched as a woman in a pea green coat and tan with matching clutch bag chatted with a merchant in front of us, in front of a sundry storefront. Next to her, a cherubic little girl dressed as a smaller version of her mother, must on a shiny scarlet apple. Me and a corn silk ponytail child made eye contact. I smiled and turned my green tinted sunglasses that protected my eyes and caught the light as it turned green. The little darling launched the apple into the car like she was on the mound at my beloved polar grounds, knocking, knocking my fedora off. Sue sat two into her cold and my eyes closed to mine. I felt an unexplained strange vibe about this place, but I couldn't understand why. At Doyle's Hotel, we settled into our rooms to freshen up before crossing over to the main shop house. You have a steak. The hind will help the cold. I'm really not hungry, Sue said. A rare steak for the lady. Hot water for me, I told the waitress as she stood over our table. You only want water? She asked. Yes, hot water for my high of tea. We don't serve high of tea. The, the, the indignation was palpable. Then I suppose it's a good thing that I brought my home. The raven-haired waitress jotted down the order with Hellenic disdain and stepped away. At the appointed hour, we got to work. This consisted of driving around the north side of the village. Our windows rolled down so that Sue, despite her cold, might pick up the railroad scent. Dawn finally arrived. Low on gas and with nothing to show for our night long patrol but a shivering suit, we returned to the door hotel where I made Sue a hot cup of ice and tea with lemon. Get some rest, love. I'll be back in your room around 11 p.m., I said. But the tea had already sent Seneca Sue sundown to Morpheus. Before turning in, I gassed up the packet at a Sinclair station. The attendant seemed boiled when I asked him to fill up the tank. We were a long way from New York City. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling better, sweetie, Sue smiled as we started our second night of railroad fencing. Just one hour prior, prior to Halloween day. Similar as the night before, Sue wore only her trench coat, a pair of maroon house slippers, a rose tinted glass, and rose tinted glasses. This after so many rural dresses resulting from spontaneous transformation. A change of clothes were in the back seat of the car. 
cold one. Sue enjoyed the night air for a few Monday hours. Oh, woo. Sue grabbed my right arm suddenly. Maddie, what's wrong? You pick up a set. I break the package and I stop. Yaza, this village. I can smell so clearly now. This, this is, Maddie, we're in a village of werewolves. I can detect their scents all around me. Feel their blood pumping. Won't their pack is sick. Hot damn, this is a problem. Indeed, it was a problem, particularly for me, a living vampire. Historically, werewolves and vampires did not go to this way. This explains the vibe that I felt earlier, not to mention the apples to my fedora. Quick, continue down the road a bit more until I say stop, or the suit. I drove along until her queue, stopping in front of the pleasant white lodge two-story house. A well-picked pumpkin patch appeared to be the source of the jack o' lanterns lying in Lincoln Avenue. Beyond a tree line, nearly naked with leaves, a large shadowy figure emerged, trudging towards the house. A little girl screamed from inside the house, its lights off and French drawn. The minty glow of the moon provided a spotlight for the final act of this affair. A large pus dripping pink mask pushed its way out, out of one of the dark fur shoulders of the form of lightning. No longer a werewolf, it was in the process of sprouting a, a, a second head. The more of the first head sagged as if suffered a stroke. One leg, the void of fur was rubbed with black skin. Presently, the thing turned in our direction. Sue handed me her eyeglasses for leaving the package. She then slipped out of the trench coat and kicked off her slippers and flipped her head to the moonlight. Knocked to the ground on hands and knees, screaming, her eyes bled as they turned from blackish red to beastly hazel. A grayish magenta fur rose to cover my life. I issued a vampire kiss. But before leaving the packet, I checked my Colt 45. Though loaded with silver bullets, I felt it would be lacking, so I removed my suit jacket. If I had to jump in, a vampire versus werewolf encounter would not be pretty. Doubtless to say, it would be more deadly chaotic than a Pier 6 longshoreman's brawl along the Hudson. A horrid grappling struggle ensued as Sue and the creature slammed into each other. Claws swiped, dirt flew, and pumpkins were crushed beneath the moon's stoic beams. I glanced quickly back at the house. The curtains now pulled the back, revealed the same after the door little girl, mouth open in horror. A moment later, an unseen person snatched her away. Sue's claws were wrapped, were wrapped tightly around the creature's throat as she struggled to avoid his bite. A deadly tug of war would seem to last forever played out before my eyes. Sue gained the upper hand by lifting the creature off the ground before it's viscerated me with the claws right that dropped the weird thing to its knees. Steam and it spilled out onto the fourth deep dark ground. Another swipe from Sue decapitated the beast, its head spiraling like a football in search of the goalpost. Blood listed into the night air. It landed beyond the tree line and rolled into the woods. Fit that shotgun away, man. I meant stoked to the shadowy figure pointed the weapon at me from the second floor, second floor window of the house. I need to use your phone to call Sheriff Bertrand. I also need a sheet to call the body water for my guy to wash up. 
for working for the sheriff and the village council, I clutched the web in his head, which I had retrieved from the woods. Soon I was bent over the back of the pack and vomited. Whomever held the gun like we didn't know that a full side of buckshot would have killed him. After a possession full minutes, the door opened. A punk man wearing a night church did the doorway. Name's Culver, he said, handed me the shit. I already phoned the sheriff's office. Deputies Truesdale and Isaacs are on their way. Your lady friend is welcome to come in and watch up. In the distance, Sue began transforming back to her spark with human form. I yanked the sheet from Colbert, placed the weird thing's head in the pumpkin patch next to his torso, and covered the remains. I then helped the dazed Sue to the house. Before waiting inside the packet, the deputy sheriff to arrive, and for sunrise to reveal who rested under that sheet. Where I wonder is the good sheriff? Help me understand something, I insisted, stepping up to Sheriff Petran's desk as he sat behind him with folded hands. Since Dumpville is a bit of awareness, why didn't you take care of Miss Labadi's situation yourselves? Sue stood behind me, dressed from coach hat to heels in black, as if mourning for Miss Labadi, whose vacant chair was next to Mayor Douglas and Dr. Bell. Mr. Cavendish, I'm sorry, Bertrand said. The people of this village have for decades and from around the world immigrated to Stumpo for a safe haven away from being butchered or all the lies of hopeless. It's no accident that our village was named after Peter Stump of Germany, and I myself am a descendant of the Bertrand family of France. So the called infamous names in life and history. Our ancestors settled in peace or harmony, but with two rules. One do not harm humans. Two, lichen shall not kill lichen. So you made me an outsider of her cat part executioner? She asked, trying to keep her anger in check. She made you her own executioner, Sue. Said Dr. Zellman. Said Dr. Zellman, choking back the most. I love Kathy with all of my life. Earlier this year, she made the fatal mistake of picking and cooking wild mushrooms. The variety she picked, while non poisonous and delicious to humans, were poisonous to lichens from southern Italy, the noodle. She developed rabies. After Farmer Mason's death, by her own volition, Kathy decided to do something that had to be done. Sheriff Bertrand stayed with me on the next side of the Oh, my, I love that woman. Now shaking, Zelda eased into his lover's vacant chair, head and hands topping. You loved her, yet now, Sue, the love of my life has become infected with that mushroom triggered rampant illness. I couldn't help but be tempted to make the doctor his own patient. He could have told us. Maddie, calm down, you lug. Whatever toxins were in me are long gone. Or have you already forgotten about the heathen incident behind the pack? I'm as good as gold, and you're still my man, said Sue, planting a kiss on my mother's cheek to the mayor and sheriff's blasphemous thoughts. A vampire and a werewolf colluding. Indeed.
on behalf of the millions of stuff world, I want to apologize for any delay. Catherine Levati, rest her soul, is now at peace. Said Mayor Douglas, speaking in an in a official tone as he handed us an envelope containing our wages. <laughs> Madison and Sue said Bertrand as he escorted us out of his office without packing a gray leather bound book under his arm. Don't think what I'm going to give you is quid pro quo. It's from the heart. Tomorrow is All Saints Day. Sue and I stared curiously at Bertrand, unsure where he was headed. How he sent him down to the city a truckload of venison meat on ice and apples. Seeing how times are hard down there in old New York, we in the village say we can help out. We nodded appreciatively. And look, there's some of the very person that placed two bottles of beer blood and a jug of fine applejack in your vehicle. We're still on probation, you know, so I hereby order you to drive the applejack out of city limits and enjoy it. Lastly, for you, Sue, a tome on like inheritance. History La Family Bertrand said, no, History La Family Bertrand, she said, reading the title. I wish vampires had a village like this, I love Manson. <laughs> Cocosa, said Bertrand. What's that, I asked. Cocosa, New York, up west near Buffalo. Them boys and gals up there like to work the midnight shift on the grain silos and elevators. We reached out to them, even challenged them to a game of baseball, but they have yet to reply. Maybe they don't know the difference between a wing bat and a baseball bat. <laughs> Chuckle for a tramp. Two and I winced at the sheriff's attempt at the After saying our goodbyes, Sue and I headed out of Stumpfield. Halloween evening festively approached. Children in costumes and others as naturally walking upright with folk who were already trick-or-treating. We were invited to stay for the grown-up activities, which included a Mardi Gras type bash around midnight, a like and run in the surrounding woods an oration for Miss Levati. But we were both missing sweet lips and wondered what sort of feline mystery she was up to. I stopped the car for a red light and saw Mrs. Culver with her after throwing daughter of Emma, dressed as a pirate and approaching us from Lincoln Avenue. The little darling released her mother's hand and ran up to the packet. But instead of throwing another apple, she nervously handed me the candy variety before stepping back to mommy. Happy Halloween, Stumpfield, I said, as we boarded off back down to the Big Apple. The sheriff was good to his word. We donated bags of apples and boxes of venison to the folks of Harlem, the Bowery, and Hell's Kitchen. They needed it a lot more than we did. In the years that followed, Sue and I made an annual October trek up the thumb for each year, growing more appreciative of the small town charm and the glow of jack o' lanterns lined up along Lincoln Avenue. The Madison Cavendish and and Seneca Sue, the, the characters come from their their how can I say they're like a, a mix of I guess things that I've read historically 
and um, maybe things I've, I've, I've seen on TV or movies. Um, starting with, with, with uh, Madison, I can actually say his character started from something that I had read years ago about uh, uh, a cartoonist. Um, he was the artist, the cartoonist that created the old crazy cat uh, uh, characters. Okay, Crazy Cat and what was the little mouse? Ignat. They were um, uh, comic strip characters that used to be in the papers at the turn of the century. And they also, I think in the 1950s, I think King Features had made, made them into a cartoon. Anyway, this, the, the gentleman that did, that created the characters come to find out years later, everybody thought that he was, um, everybody thought that he was white, but then it was found out years later that he was actually black. And he had, I guess he had issues with, with who he was and his blackness. So he hid it from people most of his life. In fact, he hid it to the point where he actually used to be in the in the offices of the newspaper that he worked for and would, would keep a, uh, a hat on his head so people wouldn't see that his hair was kinky. So um, I was kind of fascinated with the fact that when it came to racial issues, especially in the turn of the century, you had people that were passing, okay? So I took a little bit from him and I took a little bit from your, your uh, typical hard work detective, a little bit from uh, Dracula, throw in some, um, throw in some kind of HP Lovecraftian nameless horror into it. And um, also, I don't know, some people might not remember there was a, a, a science fiction show on TV called Captain Scarlet. And added it all together, you come up with Madison Cavendish. Uh, with Senate Pursue, it's basically the, the same thing, I guess, um, because these two characters they're biracial and they're also immortal. So they go from the turn of the 20th century where whether well, actually they didn't care, um, they were passing to the point where as history changes, you know, that's not necessary. So they're basically a, a, a mix of that, except, for, of course, with her, she's a werewolf. Depending on what the situation is, I actually have like three, three different processes for for um for writing a, a, a story, you know, with with these, this occult detective series. The first process is, what if Madison and Seneca Sue met uh, are in this situation? Okay, that's process number one. Process number two is, what if I took Seneca Sue and, and Madison and paired them up with, with what I see. I'm, I'm also fascinated with minor black historical figures. You know, everybody, everybody knows about, you know, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, but I kind of have a fascination with black historical figures that flew under the radar, so to speak. So, the second process is, what if Madison and Sue met up with black occultists 
Rolo Ahmed. Okay, Rolo Ahmed was a black occultist from England, and he was friends with the quote unquote the world's most wickedest man, Alistair Crowley. Okay, so that's process number two. Then process number three is, of course, what to create a, a what Alfred Hitchcock called the McGuffey. Okay, that thing that you're you're after, you know, like the Maltese Falcon or something like that. And so what I do is I even go through those three processes. I pick one, depending on you know how I feel, and I I try to write the ending of the story first. Okay, when you write the ending of the story first, you you don't have a problem you know, getting to the end and, you know, you can go back to the beginning and start there. Another thing is with my stories, uh, I also try to fit some type of action in the first couple of paragraphs because that's how you grab, grab a person's attention, you know, so which means Sometimes I'll end up, I'll kill somebody at the beginning of the story, you know, to, to grab the reader's uh, uh, attention. Um, and that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much how I go about things. Um, physically, I start with a bunch of yellow legal pads. I start right in there. Then I go to the to the computer. Uh, it's it's been a, a really beautiful a really beautiful journey. You know, again, I, I I thank you you guys for what you guys do and what the other editors do because you know as I go further in this business, I come to realize that not only is the writer is not only is writing something hard, but also to to be an editor and you have to shepherd and marshal all these different, you know, different stories into anthology and just editorial work, putting out a book in general, you know, I've come to realize it's hard, you know, and, you know, I, I, I can't see myself doing it. Um, but no, it's been a, it's been a beautiful journey. I feel blessed, um, and that's pretty much it. It you know again, I just feel blessed with what I do.